Today on the Locked On Hornets podcast, it does look like one specific coaching candidate is emerging as the favorite, but then one entered the pool over the weekend that maybe Hornets fans would be more inclined to hire here in Charlotte. Then we'll talk about the ultimate mock draft, how I think we killed it. At least we'll talk about the 13th pick and what we did there. That's all today on the Locked On Hornets podcast. You are Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. In a minute, cuz we live. We live. <laughs> Locked On Hornets, a part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available wherever you get your pods. That includes YouTube, by the way, where we're doing a lot there as well. The subscribers keep growing, and we appreciate that. We also are on Facebook. Like us on Facebook, and Doug will dress as Grandmama if we get to a 1,000 of those likes. Do we have a number there that you've seen recently, Doug. Yeah, I think we're closing in on 500. So we're about halfway to the goal. If you have uh, friends or family, tell them to go like it on Facebook. Get us get us a little bit closer to that goal. We'll get there. It's a slow it's a, it's a steady race. You know, we got the draft coming up. I know a lot of people mm-hmm. will be buzzing around this podcast around the draft. So we'll get there. I'm not worried about it. I think at 500 I also promise, oh yeah, at 500 Facebook likes, I promised someone on Twitter that I would bring back a, a very uh, fond segment in my heart, and I know some of the longtime listeners remember this, the Matt Geiger fact of the day. Oh, that was a great one. God, Matt yeah. Geiger fact of the day. That was so fantastic. I'll bring it back. 500, you get, to, you get us to 500 Facebook likes, I will bring back the Matt Geiger fact of the day. Well, and the beat to that, the intro, the imaging, it was glorious. I don't know if I still have that. I had to dig through the old archives. Yeah. yeah I, you know what I do have, though, and this kind of gets us into our first segment of the day, this news about Kenny Atkinson possibly being the front runner to be the next head coach of the Charlotte Hornets. I did roll back through the archives, Walker, and I found a whole folder named Dan Tony. And I seem to sort of remember this, that we did a segment about some of the ridiculous things that Dan Tony said on the microphone for like post-game press conferences because he would say some of the most ridiculous stuff. And so I have this whole folder and I'm really sad that I'm not going to get to empty the clip on that. Yeah. And it, you might not be able to ever, it may be somewhere down the road, but it might not happen at all with Charlotte. If Mike D'Antoni isn't the front runner as the, uh, favorite to land the Charlotte job anymore. It was, I I found the tweet. I don't know if Woj broke it first, but I I have the tweet from Sham Shrania here. Um, oh, wow. you know, there you go. Um, I look, sorry, Woj. I, he's probably paying attention oh. to me somewhere right now. I need to make sure he gets his credit, but Shams, here's the tweet from him. Warriors assistant, Kenny Atkinson has emerged as a front runner for Charlotte's head coaching job and will meet again next week. Now this week with the Hornets officials, this time, including Michael Jordan sources, tell Shams and Sam Amick. So you're having a third meeting between Kenny Atkinson and the Charlotte Hornets. This time, Michael Jordan is going to be a part of it. Pretty clearly the front runner right now. Doug, you tweeted me over the weekend. Everybody's kind of reacting, saying, great, we're going to bring back Kenny Atkinson. It's kind of the same thing as James Borrego. But you thought people were rushing to judgment real quickly as to, hey, it's not like Kenny Atkinson is in cement here. It's not like we don't have a shot at hiring Dan Tony. You Do you think that we're still overreacting to that news? I don't know. I mean, we're just reacting. I don't know if it's mm-hmm. overreacting or underreacting. We don't. Have, the only news that we have for sure is that Kenny Atkinson is scheduled to meet with Michael Jordan, which we know is the final part of this process. If someone is going to be hired as the next head coach of the Charlotte Hornets, they will meet with Michael Jordan. We don't have any indication that any of the other candidates, including Mike D'Antoni, have that meeting scheduled. So you can sort of take all of that and then put a word like front runner to it and say, well, Kenny's first. And, and to be fair, I mean, I get it kind of because like Kenny currently is, is coaching in an NBA finals. He's on Steve Kerr's bench. So you would think like Mike D'Antoni would be somebody who's slightly more available to have that meeting with Michael Jordan. Instead, we only know about the, the Kenny Atkinson meeting. So it does indicate that certainly uh, it, it would be a preferred you know, choice of the organization. We'll just have to see. Yeah, I mean, clearly it's a good point you bring up because it's not like D'Antoni is coaching in the finals, so D'Antoni should be available unless he's got something else in his personal life I don't know about, um, which I'm sure he does. 
I just think it would be easier for the Hornets, especially if they wanted him, they could schedule something first and foremost. But now in those reports that we had heard that it looked like there was one faction of the Charlotte Hornets that wanted Mitch Cup, or excuse me, that wanted Mike D'Antoni. There was mm-hmm. one that wanted Kenny Atkinson. And mm-hmm. if Kenny Atkinson is the guy that's wanted ultimately by Michael Jordan, he's going to have the strongest say, and he's going to be the next head coach as long as everything goes well. Would we you don't know like, that, right? Do we? Do we know yeah. that Michael Jordan? Do we know that like Michael Jordan is the faction that wanted Kenny Atkinson? I don't know. Do we know that for sure? No, um, I I know that that has been something talked about. But other than that, it's not been anything uh, that has Rumors been Rumors and innuendo. Yeah. So, um, you know, we'll see exactly who ends up being the head coach. But Kenny Atkinson, I think it is fair to say that he's the front runner after he's the only one now with three meetings with the Charlotte Hornets. And now he's getting to the final boss, Michael Jordan. Um, you know, if Kenny Atkinson is the guy, Doug, do you feel like this is just copy and pasting what we had with James Borrego and applying him uh, just basically say, OK, no, we we liked what James Borrego did, but we want a different voice, and so we're going to get a different voice and have him basically be the same guy and bring him in. Uh, what are the differences? What are the similarities? And does it make sense to you that he would be the front runner? Yeah, I've seen some of that commentary around this news that that Kenny Atkinson is essentially James Borrego 2.0, and and I think that's rooted in the idea that Kenny Atkinson is viewed as somebody that has a strength in player development that was brought into a young Brooklyn Nets team to turn that team around, get it into playoff shape, and and to Kenny's credit, did so, but then was removed when, when the Brooklyn Nets really wanted to make a serious move towards the playoffs with superstars and, and NBA Finals aspirations. So, so I, I understand it from that perspective, but I would say, no, he's not James Borrego 2.0 in terms of personality. I mean, I think these guys are going to be drastically different in in just tone and demeanor and I always say that like these these head coaching hires tend to be reactions to the previous hire so Steve Clifford to me Kenny Atkinson fits more in that Steve Clifford model in terms of tone and demeanor and how he's going to look on the sidelines how he's going to react on the sidelines and maybe how he'll be behind the scenes as well Whereas James Borrego was was a temperament was was taking the temperature down from Steve Clifford, and now it seems they want to raise the temperature up. Yeah, they did not go the exact opposite, like you see with so many franchises in any sport, saying, "All right, we had this personality, we had this schematic type of philosophy, and we want to go the exact opposite with this new hire." And really, a lot of these teams will overshoot it, and they need to find a happy medium here. They're definitely not doing that by going the exact opposite. Like that's, that's fairly obvious here. You are somewhat still in the player development mold. And I think that's my point, Doug, this team ultimately decided to move on from James Borrego because they felt like there was another step to have been taken. And they didn't do that last year. Kenny Atkinson, the most wins he ever had was 42 and they got to the playoffs. That was great. The next year, if you look at that roster, that was probably not a forty-two win. Oh no, but it wasn't. But it wasn't awful though. Like they actually had some young talent on that team that would eventually continue to be very good. And you speak right, but that. But at that time, that's what I'm saying. Like at that time, they would go on to be that good. But at the time, right? He deserves credit for sure. You know that. That's why he's here. You know because that's why he's on Steve Kerr's bench. You know if if you're if you if you are concerned about this move. And if and if you're open to hearing anything that would make you less concerned, I would say look at the fact that he's on Steve Kerr's bench. You think I just don't I don't see Steve Kerr as somebody that like is a bad judge of coaching character. And and I think having him on the sidelines in an NBA finals, you're getting you know, it's not head coaching experience, but you're get you're you've been to an NBA finals on a bench. I think that's important. Well, yeah, I look, Kenny Atkinson is going to be fine. I, I'd rather have Dan Tony. I certainly would rather have Quinn Snyder. You know, yeah, I mean, you know, moment. I would, too. I'm just yeah. trying to deal with the reality yeah. of the situation. I, and I'll tell you why I would want Dan Tony, because to me, Dan Tony signals we are ready to get serious about contending in the Eastern Conference. And we want to bring someone in that is a that is a surefire hit that has done, been there, done that, knows how to do it with Kenny. Uh, certainly he's been in the playoffs. So he's not James Borrego 2.0 because he's been in the playoffs <laughs> and James Borrego's never been in the playoffs. Yeah. But, but he's not a short, he's not a surefire thing. You are betting that Kenny Atkinson can take your roster and do what he wasn't able to fully realize in, in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, 
Let's get to more of some of the Kenny Atkinson takes on the other side. We'll talk about another coaching candidate that could be there for the Charlotte Hornets. Maybe not, but we can wish, right? Coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. More coaching talk, Kenny Atkinson, as well as Quinn Snyder, who is now officially a free agent to be had, possibly. And we'll talk about the Charlotte Hornets' chances of getting him. This episode is brought, uh, brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports info. You can find all the latest sports developments, news, and odds, including this year's basketball championship matchup, the NHL Hockey Conference Finals, Major League Baseball, and of course, all the latest fighting news from MMA and UFC to boxing. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sport wagering information, including live betting, esports, and more. You can head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and the action bet online where the game starts we'll talk about some more of these hornets developments coming up next on the locked on hornets podcast this is locked on hornets we need mitch Kupchak to throw a party like sam presti can he party like presti and Russell Westbrook. <laughs> yeah, but who are you going to get to perform? Because remember, Nas, they got Nas. I, they did get Nas. Man, who is Mitch Kupchak getting to that Nelly. party to perform? Can we get Nelly? No. Can we get, P. Yeah, I hate you right now. <laughs> it's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. Let's talk a little more about Kenny Atkinson before we get to this Quinn Snyder news. Um, you know, so Kenny had that success with the Nets. That's why he's in these interviews. That's why he was a hot candidate now has emerged as the favorite for the Charlotte Hornets. I think when the Hornets want to move on and take that next step, not just have somebody that can come in and develop players, then Mike D'Antoni or somebody else would fit that bill a lot more. Even a Darvin Ham, who is an assistant coach, eventually he chooses the Lakers job and maybe you never had a shot. I don't know. But somebody like that would have at least provided some sort of ceiling I would have been happy with. And now... If you go to Atkinson, who I was I was fine with at the beginning of this process, and then you start to do more research on him because, you know, we've never had to talk about Kenny Atkinson like that before. It's like, okay, it'd be the most underwhelming decision that they could have made throughout this, right? Like, I'm not disappointed. I'm not thrilled. I'm just, okay, this is fine. You know, it's not – it. when we did the coaching rankings, I think I had him, like, fifth on the list – of seven but it was a top five group that i was okay with like he was like the last one and one of the things i like about him is we talked with adam armbrecht of locked on nets one of the things he does is he does a good job of dividing minutes up for his most talented players and that was one of my biggest problems with james brago not playing what i thought were the most talented players and here's somebody that does right that i think he did a good job with those minutes restrictions now the funny joke that you're making that face about, Doug, and people can see on YouTube if they're watching, is the fact that he might not play LaMelo. How much every LaMelo stand, plus. quote unquote, you might, you might put out there, how much they would want him to play. Because yeah. there are some people that want LaMelo to play 40 minutes a game. And there's only been two players, <clears throat> excuse me, that Kenny Atkinson has ever played more than 30. It was Kyrie Irving and Spencer Dinwiddie is the other one. And they played like mm -hmm. 32 minutes a game, 31, 32. So, you know, I mean, and, and, and honestly, that again, well, I think, you know, if we can try to, we, all we're doing is we're reading a little tea leaves. We're taking comments here, whatever the little, little things they give us and try to put it together and try to figure out what, what, what they could be thinking. If they do, if they indeed do hire Kenny Atkinson, and I can say one of the things that stood out to me from the Mitch Kupchak conversation was that, you know, they wanted to see more time for some of these rookies mm -hmm. that they didn't really get, you know, an indication of what they could or couldn't do. And I think you're going to see Kenny come in and spread out some minutes and divide them up between the younger players, probably go to a 10, 11 man rotation early in the season. Whereas James Brego last season for reasons uh, that that I think were fair would shortened up the rotation significantly, uh, but didn't necessarily give one particular player a ton of minutes either. So I, I think that's what they're looking for for Kenny to come in. Hey, we need you. We'd like to make the playoffs like you did that one time in Brooklyn, but we don't want to fully neglect this system of players we're bringing in because, as Mitch Kupchak has indicated, he doesn't particularly feel like this team. Is net or or he doesn't he said he doesn't want to get ahead of himself again you know and 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 try to mm -hmm. go out and get a bunch of veterans and compete when they're not necessarily ready. 
Yeah. And to have Kenny Atkinson here to maybe bridge that, if you will, I, I hate using that word because I don't want to bridge coach. I want the coach in place that's going to help you now and beyond. Did, did we already do this with James Borrego? I think that's where some of the similarities come in. And if if you feel like he is going to be somewhat of that guy again, I'd rather just go out and get the winner right now. You know, I mean, it doesn't mean that we're supposed to win a championship this year, but I'd like the guy that's on this roster coaching this roster I would like for him to have that ability down the road if that's ultimately the goal with LaMelo Ball as your star. I don't want to have this coach and then we'll move on to that one. I mean, is it a three-step process? I, I don't Total, think it has listen, to be that. I would be disappointed if they had a real opportunity to hire Mike D'Antoni over Kenny Atkinson and they ended up choosing Kenny Atkinson. I don't know if we're ever going to really know that for sure. Mm -hmm. I wonder, too, if there with the with the D'Antoni situation, if there was an issue about how much control over basketball operations they were willing to give up, I think you would have to give up significantly less for a Kenny Atkinson than you might have to with a Mike D'Antoni. But the th but I, I while I'll be disappointed, I won't be apocalyptic about it because I think you know it, it would be way different if Kenny Atkinson this was going to be his fourth stop as a head coach and he was never really able to get over the hill and win playoff series. We've only seen him in one stop in Brooklyn, right? Mm -hmm. So like I I my mind is open to the possibility that Kenny Atkinson with the right organization, with the right players and, and knowing that he is uh, regarded as someone who can help point guards uh play even better than they than they were previously able to play by giving them, you know, tools and 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 schematics that are that are preferable to their style of play. Then I'm open to the possibility that he could come in and do something that he wasn't able to fully realize in Brooklyn. Yeah, and um, you know, Kenny Atkinson being that guy wouldn't make me you know crazy disappointed either. Apocalyptic, right? No, I'll I, be I would sad. Not I'm going to be sad. I'm going to cry because I, yeah, I have all I of this. Tony said, "I'm going to." Oh, I'm going. You know what? I'm fine. If they the day they make the hire, I'm just going to I'm going to bring that folder full of D'Antoni sound, and I'm just going to what slowly could have been, right? slowly leak it out through the episode, mourning the loss. Of Mike D'Antoni, oni, 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 oni. Yeah, yeah, right. As it is now auto-corrected in your phone when you decide to type out that name. Yeah, <laughs> the player development, good. The defensive philosophy, he's put up some good defensive numbers. Ultimately, this roster is going to have to make some changes in order to enhance that end of the court. But if Kenny Atkinson can get a rim protector, he's shown that he can do a good job as long as he has that piece in place and maybe you get some other perimeter defenders around him. You know who else has been very good at that? It's been Quinn Snyder, who has one of the best rim protectors of all time over in Utah, or at least he used to. It was reported he over the weekend that Quinn Snyder has decided himself to leave the Jazz organization, that he tried to come out and dispel any rumors that were it's because of a difference in philosophy between himself and Danny Ainge or Utah. You know, he simply thinks, this is him talking, he simply thinks that the Jazz players need a new voice and he is gone after eight years of coaching Utah. And we've been waiting a long time now to try to get this information out. And eventually... He decides to leave himself. He wasn't fired. He's the one that's leaving. And it looks like he's going to take a year off, Doug. I, so when you yeah. when you have a Hornets vacancy and you wait just to see, I think that's worthwhile. You know, Quinn Snyder, he calls for that kind of patience to see if he's going to be available. You make the call. You figure out if he's if there's a way that he can coach the Hornets. If not, if he's just going to take a year off, fine. You move on and you get your Atkinson or your Dan Tony. But if there is a way to at least entice him somehow, then you got to exercise all of those opportunities. And I think there were some indications out there that not only did he want some time away, but that he wasn't particularly interested in in any of the openings, including Charlotte. So. I mean, if that's the case, if he's not interested, he's not interested, and you mm -hmm. you move on. It would be disappointing because I think, you know, and, and but it is interesting the whole idea of him resigning because he thinks that the team needs a new voice. Mitch Kupchak thinks that the Hornets needed a new voice, uh, and and so they're getting they're going to get one regardless. It's going to be slightly different. The messaging is going to be slightly different, and you know that's the thing with the the whole coaching hire business anyway. I think there's a lot of good discussion about how much a head coach can actually like significantly improve your team. Like how much of it is just yep. getting the right players on the floor and, and matching all of that. It's not as if one guy is going to come in and just completely transform the organization. 
Uh, but I think a new voice matters and, and what that voice uh, can get a team to do. This team needs to significantly improve internally and externally on the defensive end of the floor. And if he can do that, then the Hornets will be a better basketball team. I don't know what the record's going to be. I don't know if it's going to be 50 wins, but they will be better if they can improve their defense from like bottom of the league to middle of the road. Uh, and Kenny Atkinson has proved that he can do that. He kind of did that with the Nets. He took them from a team that could not defend at all and made them an okay defensive team. That's exactly what the Hornets need to do. Uh, so we can't underrate that new voice aspect of all of this. Yeah, I, I, I saw a tweet from Seth Partno of The Athletic, used to work with the Milwaukee Bucks organization, and he put out, like, he had heard one time a coach say, look, 40% of coaching is just getting your players to play hard. <laughs> you know I mean? That's, it, it's such a huge Well, they listen part. to you. The, yeah. the, the whole thing with the reason why Steve Clifford uh, is no longer coaching the Charlotte Hornets Despite getting to the playoffs, almost winning a series, getting about as close as you can to uh, winning a series, damn purple shirt guy in game six of that Heat series, ruining it for everyone. <laughs> getting, I mean, Clifford, that guy, purple shirt guy, I don't know if we ever talked about this, but he owes Clifford some money. <laughs> like he owes him, he owes oh, him a severance. We'll talk about it. Yeah, yeah, he owes. Okay, well, that's fine. He owes him a severance package. I don't know if anyone said that. Show me the tape of anyone saying that. Right. Um, but, Steve Clifford, they they needed a new voice because the team had stopped listening to Steve Clifford. And and the the messaging, no matter how good the messaging was just on its face, the messenger, we, the, the team had started to tune that guy out. I really think you get like four years. And if you win a playoff series, that gets extended in, you know, maybe two, maybe four years, you know? So he gets eight years. He said, look, I'm not, I think I could win a playoff series maybe, but that's about as far as I can go. I got to go somewhere else. And I think good on Quinn Snyder for recognizing that, even if the Jazz didn't. All right. I, I want to talk a little more about Quinn Snyder before we get to our thought process on what we did with the 13th pick in the ultimate mock draft. But coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. We'll get to exactly the process. I think we killed the NBA draft this year. The ultimate Locked On mock draft. 13 and 15, were we willing and dealing? Did we make the selection at 13? You're going to have to find out in just a moment's worth of time, but not before. I ask a favor of you. We have an important favor to ask you. We put together a survey so we can learn more about listeners like you and make your favorite Locked On podcast even better. This is your opportunity to tell us what you like and don't like about Locked On Podcast. So you can go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey right now and get started. It won't take very long. Everyone that completes a survey, too, can qualify for a chance to win one of 10 $100 Ticketmaster gift cards. So you can take the audience survey when you go to LockedOnPodcast.com slash survey. We always appreciate your help. Plenty more to come on the Locked On Hornets podcast coming up next. This is Locked on Hornets. Then I clicked on M. Thomas. I'm like, who in the hell is M. Thomas? Matt Thomas is oh, his name. Oh, NBA legend, Matty Thomas. <laughs> he play, Matt he Thomas. Didn't play at all. I'm pretty sure Matt Thomas <laughs> served me at an Applebee's the other day. It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. Quinn Snyder, available. We're going to try to figure out if he can or if he even wants to coach the Charlotte Hornets. But before we get to that mock draft, Doug, you were kind of asking the question, how much does a coach really help your basketball team? Does it ultimately just come down to the players and it might make a little bit of a difference, but is it just this huge, overwhelming difference that a coach can provide? I think there are certainly some, some pretty big factors that a, a new coach can provide. But when, when we talk about player development versus winning right now, some of that stuff works itself out more so on the player development side. You know, if you're playing good basketball enough to win, and then those young players are learning how to win in their role because they're buying into a coach because they are winning those 50 games, they are getting to the playoffs, then don't those younger players ultimately become better just by being a part of the process. And so I don't know if you would look at Quinn Snyder and say, that's a player development coach, but Donovan Mitchell comes in and is excellent. How much of that is Donovan just being a stud? How much of that is him playing in a Quinn Snyder system that allowed him to be so good and eventually reach those all-star appearances? Rudy Gobert was not a success story immediately upon stepping into the NBA, 
his time with Quinn Snyder, Rudy Gobert becomes one of the best rim protectors of all time. But we don't consider Quinn Snyder that player development coach like we do Kenny Atkinson. And so it's funny, we shortchange a Snyder because he is winning so many games with the Utah Jazz by saying, oh, well, he's your win now guy. Man, he can bring some guys along for the ride too and make them better players. And so, you know, <laughs> do you just get the winning coach and think, Man, they can develop some of these players too, even a Mike D'Antoni. You know, how many of those guys with the Rockets were able to learn and get better in their role, like a Clint Capella for you know, or, or somebody like that? That that's the philosophical question that I would provide. You know, it, okay, great. Maybe, maybe Kenny Atkinson was just starting to get to the winning now mode. We know he's a player developer, but it's not like Quinn Snyder, some of these other coaches that win now aren't. And I think that's the point I wanted to make. Yeah, and I I agree with you. I think from the franchise, if I again, I'm trying to sort of take some comments and and figure out if I can sort of reason out why they would look at Kenny Atkinson versus some of these others. And I think there might be this perception of certain coaches need to come in to a more fully formed mm -hmm. version of a team uh, that's ready to compete right at this instant. And, and I just, I don't get a sense from Mitch Kupchak that he, that he, and by extension, the organization really feel like this team next season is ready to seriously compete in the Eastern conference, even win a playoff series. I think, I think really they've got to get to the playoffs, see what they have. Cause you get, that's the whole thing this is why, you know, I, I was so against, fully tanking because I think like the, the getting to the playoffs, getting through that play in and into the actual playoff series, that's when you can really see what you have in certain players. Like we're not going to know, and this is the tough thing about my, I really wish we could have seen miles bridges in a seven game series before we had to make this decision about whether to yep. you know resign him and for how much, because you don't really know who that's a big takeaway from this NBA finals. To me, you don't really know who guys are until you put them through the fire. I mean, Derek white, I mean, I, you know, I didn't think Derek White was that dude. I mean, I was high on him coming out of the draft, but I didn't know he's that dude until, you know, he started playing this well in this in these series. What? You got a face. Oh, oh, no, no. It's funny. I think the Derek White conversation has been all over the place since he's been traded to Boston. It's nothing you said. It's just we loved him. He fit like a glove up there with Boston. And then he was awful in some of these series where he was scoring like two points in the series before we get to the he's finals. And the then finals. he has an excellent game. It's just the roller coaster that is <laughs> Derek White has been very, very interesting to see how people reacted to it yeah but uh but but, I, but again i think you point. have to see how these players do in these seven game series and so you know i think that's what you know if, if kenny can do that then he's the, the bar for success as a head coach for the charlotte hornets is not that high no <laughs> so you know but i think he, even the people even the detractors even the people that are like not loving this idea if kenny gets into a playoff series i think it's yeah. all all great. Yeah, and and again, that that's where I am. I'm not loving the idea. I don't necessarily hate it. He plays his good players. He did it, he did have success at a time where the Nets had nothing going for them. There was nothing to play for except for pride and they get to the playoffs and uh help develop some players there. And I wonder about his time in Golden State, how much of that free-flowing offense can rub off on maybe a Charlotte Hornets job where you do have to change your offense and change your scheme to the personnel that you might have on your current roster, right? So you have LaMelo. Nobody was like LaMelo up there with Brooklyn. You had D'Angelo Russell, ran a lot of ISO, you know, eventually got a, uh, you know, eventually got an all-star appearance. But anyways, you know, maybe some of that can rub off and we'll see exactly what Atkinson would do here. And maybe you would have somebody that would contribute right away as a 13th overall draft pick. We got somebody, Doug, that I think would get some real minutes immediately in the ultimate locked on NBA mock draft when we selected, when we were on the board and made our only lottery pick just two more later. We're at a lottery, but we have the 15th selection. You just want to talk about what we did at 13, right? Yeah, tomorrow we, okay. we, we're running out of time here. So tomorrow right. we will get into what we did at the 15th selection. Spoiler alert. We didn't pick at 15. Mm. <laughs> what did we do? What does that mean? I think we just crushed it. All right. Do you want to reveal the details on what we did at 13? Yeah. With the 13th selection, the Charlotte Hornets in the uh, Locked On NBA Ultimate Mock Draft selected Mark Williams out of Duke. Yes, that's right, folks. We made the, the, the selection that everyone, I think, wanted us to make. Getting Mark Williams, a, a center prospect out of Duke, played two seasons 
at Duke. And, uh, you know, we've talked a lot about him on the show, Walker. He's just fundamentally sound, someone that can come in and probably contribute something off of the bench uh, right away uh, and, and helps him with rim protection, but also has some uh, some decent offensive skills as well. I, you and know, he fell to us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think measured really well at the combine, you know, standing reach is absolutely through the roof. The guy can almost dunk a basketball without having to jump. It is very similar to what Rudy Gobert provided when I think he was at the combine or, you know, his talking about his standing reach. I think the one thing that's not talked about as much with Mark Williams that I want to say real quickly is I do think the touch is legitimately there with Mark Williams. I, I think most people are just pigeonholing him as this drop coverage defender that can protect the rim. And that's clearly by far and away the most important skill he has and the one that he's going to contribute to the Charlotte Hornets. That's why you're drafting him. I don't want to get it twisted. But there is a pretty good jump shot on this guy. Like, again, close to 75% free throw shooter. But if you look at his touch around the rim where he had the most dunks in all of college basketball, but there were also some finishes where, you know, he was laying it in and doing so with some kind of finesse, the step back Dirk fadeaway jumper. And that's not an exaggeration. Look at that jumper against Michigan state from the baseline where he decides, you know what, I'm going to kick this leg out. I'm just going to shoot a jumper over you nails it. Like that's the part of his game that can maybe be explored further, but it's there. And so anyways, clearly the, the defense, he can come in right away and help you out, be that lob threat for LaMelo, which is where most of his offense is going to come from and it's yeah. going to be uh, come from. It's going to be awesome. I, I, I like Mark Williams, really solid pick, and I would be pretty happy with that selection. Yeah. The concern, I think long-term on Mark Williams and why he wasn't you know, in the Jalen Duran conversation in the, you know, sort of mid lottery while he, while, why he fell to the Charlotte Hornets in the late lottery is this idea that he may not be able to really switch on defense, mm -hmm. that he's going to be a player that is a little stiff legged and lateral movement, not very quick. And so, you know, that there's going to be some issues there when he switched on to guards. So, so, but if he's an elite shot blocker, again, it's sort of the whole Rudy Gobert conversation is like, can, can this player be good enough, uh, inside to help you in the regular season? And then you figure it out in the playoffs. You know, that's, that's kind of my idea there, but I, I think we're lucky to get Mark Williams. We did aggressively attempt to move up in the draft and get Duran. And that was sort of a me call that I pulled you into. I, I really wanted to go move and, and try to get Duran. But ultimately, the price tag kept being P.J. Washington, and you and I made a made a pact that this season, in the ultimate mock draft, you and I would both have to agree, and I couldn't get you over to my side <laughs> and move P.J. now. So the, the our, our version of the Hornets keeps P.J. We add mm -hmm. Mark Williams, but I'm not satisfied because the Hornets still don't have a starting center. I don't see Mark Williams as a player that's going to, if he is starting, that means you've got some injuries uh, or that means you didn't bring in enough talent. You're in trouble. Well, so that, we still have to you, solve that. That that means you didn't get your free agent because you don't think Jalen Duran would have come in and, and immediately been that starter, right? Like you always talked about how it might, he's, he's the developmental guy too. Well, yes, but here's the thing. I, I think of the two players, Duran and Mark Williams, Duran had a chance at stealing that, that starting spot by the end of the first season, I think. Not Mark Williams. Um, yeah, yeah, so he's I think, a better I think player Mark Williams sure. is going to be a yeah. solid bench player for the Hornets if they find you know, that starting center in free agency or maybe trade or maybe trade. We'll see. We'll see yeah. what happens with this 15th pick. You never know. Yeah, I, I, I do like for sure if Jalen is available, you have to take him if you know he even slips. And we already discussed right when you would look to move up, what you'd be willing to do there. But he is special. He's he's an athletic guy, long wings, a long wingspan, you know, wa watching him play. It's it's impressive. But I, I do like having PJ and Mark on the same roster. So you go small ball. You need somebody to defend the rim. Now you at least have somebody to go to. And you did not have that for a long, long time. Yeah. And with Mark on this roster, at least in our hypothetical world, now you have, okay, let's send out the seven footer to go, you know, block yeah. shots and help out with this guy that's killing us in the post with whatever team it is. So my thinking on this, and this is this is my opinion, but I feel strongly about it, that Mark Williams might be a starter won't be a star. And I think that Jalen Duren will absolutely be a starter in the league and, and might be a star. 
Yeah. It's not, n- n- nothing's guaranteed when you get out in the mid late, m- mid to late lottery. But I think that's the level that we were talking about. And that's why I was trying to trade in to get Duran because I think it's a player that absolutely can be a starter. Mark Williams might. And I'm not saying it's impossible for him to be a star, but I just don't think, I just don't think he specs out like that. Well, you wanted to bring in a veteran to help and get that starting center in place. Did we do that with the 15th overall selection? And did we keep a first round pick? I don't know. We're going to all have to find out tomorrow when we talk might about be a the 15th I mean, We might, we, you know, we had a lot of options there at 15. A Baji, I'll just, I'll just spoil it. Like a Baji was there. There were some players there. Some players mm-hmm. fell because some, Again, these mock drafts, you know, these locked on hosts, they they really just get they get honed in on someone and they and they can't let go. And so you'll have players go way above where where they're sort of big boarded out or mocked out. So we had some of those situations. Uh, so we had a really tough choice to make at fifteen. But uh, I'll tell you, I always feel like in these mock drafts, Walker, that we are representing the fan base. We might we can't possibly please everyone, right? But I we feel a responsibility to do in this mock. We're not we're taking this seriously. We want to do something that we legitimately feel like can benefit the franchise in the long term. Yeah, and I, I want to <clears throat> get to some of the processes that we had coming down to this decision because there were a lot of options on the table, not just players available at 15, but trades. People I know you blown, were people and and this I think again, you know, I get I get that it's a mock draft, right? It's a bunch of podcast hosts getting together for a mock draft. <laughs> yeah, but totally. all, but I'll say this like so so you know, I hesitate to extrapolate anything from a mock draft and say, well, that means that this is going to happen in the, in the real real life world in the war room. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you have to understand that all of these hosts of these shows are the same as us. They're doing daily podcasts. They're the most, you know, in tune with their team and, and with the NBA at large. And so I do feel like of any mock draft, you know, these national mock drafts that CBS does, it's just it's just national guys that know a little bit about the Hornets, they know a little bit about the Pelicans, they know a little bit about the Suns, and so they try to, you know, take those narratives and figure out who a team is going to take or what a team is going to do. But all of these hosts know intimately about their team and what their team needs, and then we all share kind of in this document like what other, you know, what we were looking for. And so I'll say that our phones, our DMs were blowing up with trade offers because they recognize, hey, this team has 13, 15. They're looking for a specific thing. They're looking to get into the playoffs. And and so people were hitting us up left and right, trying to make deals happen. Gordon Hayward was on the table in a lot of these deals. Uh, there, uh, we had PJ one in Washington. place, didn't we? Didn't, didn't we that? have one in didn't we have one in place that we had an agreed upon trade, but liked one better? Is that Oh no, maybe not. Maybe not. I think we were we were close to one, but yeah, we eventually well, we had a know, lot of trades for the thirteenth pick. Yeah, I yeah. mean there were there was so many things in play. So find out tomorrow. We'll reveal what we did with the fifteenth pick, and then make sure you're subscribed to the Ultimate Mock Draft feed. You can do it right now. You can go to your podcast app and search Ultimate Mock Draft, and uh, you can go ahead and subscribe now. And when the episodes come out. It's all of these teams talking about what they did and a lot of uh, professional people coming in to give you the like scouting reports on all of these players. So it's it's really one of the most fun things and one of the biggest things we do all year. So check all it out. Right. Doug serving as the ultimate company man there telling you to go listen to all this stuff. And he's totally right because we are putting a lot of work into this and it was a lot of fun. So hopefully you enjoy it and hopefully you continue to enjoy it when we talk about the 15th overall selection come tomorrow and what we decided to do with that pick. All right. Thanks for making Lockdown Hornets your first listen every day. Make your second listen Locked On NBA Big Board. Host Rafael Barlow from NBA Draft Junkies and author of NBA Big Board Newsletter is joined by Richard Stamen, Sam Ferris, and Leif Tolan giving fans an in-depth look look into the NBA draft, the mock draft, player rankings, and of course, big boards. It's free and available wherever you get your podcasts. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow.